actually waiting for my primer to arrive. And when it does, it's gonna come in a tube like this and I'm going to have to dissolve it. And so a quick tip is you can add one microliter per nanomole for a one millimolar solution or 10 microliters per nanomole for a hundred micromolar solution. And then later I can make work, I can dilute that to get my working stocks. Um, and you keep aliquots if I'm gonna be doing this a lot. Um, so there are various aspects of dealing with resuspending and storing um, DNA or RNA um, that you might get um, when you order like an oligo synthesized in one of these like short pieces of DNA or RNA. Okay, so I'm just gonna jump into some of this stuff about how we do it. So when, we, when it comes to this sort of thing, there are going to be some formal ways we can do things as well as some shortcuts and I'll introduce you to both. And as you get more familiar with doing these, it'll get easier to do like these sort of things in your head and kind of see things, but it's important to recognize what you're doing and why. And so first of all, what are we doing? We're going to take this DNA or this RNA um, that comes as this powder and we want to resuspend it into a, so, so like dissolve it into a liquid form um, and then store it. And so we need to think about how we're going to store it in a way that's going to be most usable in the future and that's going to protect it. Um, so DNA and especially RNA are going to be kind of fragile and so we're not going to want um, to do things that are going to hurt them. And one of the things that can hurt them is nucleases. Um, so these are DNA and RNA chewers. Um, and especially the RNA chewers, they're like everywhere. Um, and so when you're working with RNA, you want to take extra careful precautions. And I have more on that in other posts. But the, the bare minimum, um, use like filter tip, um, pipette tips, and wipe down your surfaces. Um, if you have like that RNA zap, zap spray, you can use that to wipe down surfaces and that sort of thing. And then you want to make sure that the solutions that you're dissolving your, your oligos into are going to be free of the nucleases as well. And so what are these solutions that we're going to be diluting into? There are some options. Um, and so commonly, um, the one that's like most recommended is going to be this TE buffer. Um, so TE stands for TRIS EDTA. Um, and if this is reminding you of when we talked about running buffers for electrophoresis, we have like TAE, which is TRIS acetate EDTA, and TPE, TRIS borate EDTA. Here we just have TRIS EDTA. Um, and so the TRIS and the EDTA are important because the TRIS is going to keep the pH steady. Often you're doing using like 10 millimolar TRIS, the pH of 7.5 to 8. Um, and then the EDTA is going to help hide metals from nucleases that are going to chew up your DNA or RNA. Um, EDTA can also interfere with other things. Um, this is a pretty uh, low concentration that you're going to be using it. Um, so they say it shouldn't interfere with too much stuff. Um, I typically leave it out. Um, I actually often store it in nucleus-free water, as I'll talk about. Um, but this, but sorry, um, yeah. But so you can just leave it out and store it in like 10 millimolar trust piece. HCl, pH 8. As I said, alternatively, you can use nuclease free water, um, such as when you like those little bottles of like molecular biology grade um, water that are like certified to be RNAs and DNAs free. Um, and remember, you don't want to be storing in something like a TPE because that borate is going to potentially cause problems, which is why um, you don't want to use TBE gels if you're doing like things where you have to have like enzymatic activity or whatever. Basically check out the TEAE versus TBE post for that. So that's what we're going to be resuspending in. Um, and so often I do water trust can actually interfere with some things later on as well, especially if you're doing any sort of um, labeling or cross-linking um, that's going to, because it has that um, amine group, it can be cross-reactive with things. Okay, and so that's what we're going to store it in, um, but now we need to figure out what concentration we're going to store it. Um, and also as a note, I usually store it at my DNA at minus 20, and so it's like the normal freezer, and then the RNA at minus 80, so the, the super duper freezer. Um, and when I freeze it, I'm going to dilute it to in the initial, in the bottle, in the little tube that it comes to, in a high concentration stock. And then I dilute aliquots 
of either my working concentration or a middle concentration. Um, I store these aliquots so that I can avoid free thawing them, and more importantly, so that I avoid contaminating that original stock. If you contaminate one of those um, little aliquots, it's not the end of the world, especially if you make your aliquot single use, so you only have to thaw them once. But if you contaminate that stock file, well, now, now you're like, don't have anything to go back to. And so this is why having those aliquots can be really helpful. Um, additionally, having those aliquots can be helpful because it allows you to keep a higher concentration stock. And if you keep, when you keep it at a higher concentration, it's going to be more stable um, and you're going to lose less of it um, because there's going to be less relative stuff that can stick on the walls of the well. And if you have it more concentrated, if a little bit sticks on the wall, it's kind of like a drop in a bucket or a pool, um, as opposed to if you have a really dilute solution um, and a little bit sticks on the wall, that's going to be a much bigger deal um, in terms of what concentration is actually in your tube. So what concentration should be in your tube? Well, this is going to depend in part on what you're going to want to do with it um, and in part on how much you have in your tube and stuff and practical considerations. I should also note that sometimes there's going to be a, like sometimes you order a primer or something that you know you're only going to use once. And then sometimes I might get lazy and if there's enough room in the tube, I'll just dilute it up to the, fi to the final concentration. But especially if it's something like, maybe it's a primer that you're gonna use over and over or it's um, RNA that you're gonna use in a lot of different experiments, that's when I'm really doing the um, really higher concentration stock and then the aliquots. So when I was working with some RNAs and stuff, I would often um, keep a one millimolar stock. So I add one microliter per nanomole. And then if um, for other common things, I typically do like a 100 micromolar. So you add 10 microliters per nanomole. And then later we'll show you how we can then calculate how we um, dilute those to our working concentration. So how we, what we actually want to use it at. Um, so as I said, these, these are little, these little like shortcuts and they're easy because you can find on the tube or on the sheet that comes with a tube, it'll tell you how many nanomoles are in there. This is not the same amount of nanomoles as like when you order it. So when you order it, um, it might have either like a guaranteed yield or like a scale or something. That's just going to be like some sort of estimate. If it's the guaranteed yield, they say, okay, at least you'll get at least this much. If it's like um, the scale, then it might be like, that's their, what they start with, but then they like purify it down or whatever. So basically that's not going to be the same as the amount that you like quote unquote ordered um, and or the quote unquote amount that you ordered. Um, and so basically you want to look at the tube to see how many animals there are. And then if you want a one millimolar stock, you can add one microliter per nanomole. And if you want a hundred micromolar stock, you can add 10 microliters per nanomole. Um, if you don't believe me, try dimensional analysis and see for yourself. Um, so dimensional analysis, I have a post on this as well, but basically it's a way to let us convert between units. So we're gonna be dealing in terms of molarity and here we're just doing this unit dimension analysis between these different um, between these different metric prefixes typically. So a milli is gonna be a thousandth, micro a millionth, nano a, a billionth. So you have a billionth of a micromole per thousandth of a liter. Um, and so it works out to being one millimolar. Um, and so I encourage you to work it out for yourself as well as for this 100 micromolar. It came, yay. So the tube tells me that there are 25.7 nanomoles in here. So if I add 257 microliters of my truss buffer, um, that will then get me to 100 micromolars. And so typically what I do is I add the liquid in there and then I let it sit for a few minutes um, to re-dissolve. Then once it's re-dissolved, I'll pipette it up and down. Oh, and I spun it first. Um, but then I'll pipette it up and down to make sure that it's all mixed. Sometimes you might see a little bit still stuck on there. Um, you can try um, like a little quick vortex or stuff like that if there's stuff stuck. Um, if there's stuff stuck, still stuck, it's probably not actually like your DNA or RNA. It's stuff from the like synthesis. Um, and you can just like move to a different tube or do some sort of like column purification or whatever. There's more information on the IDT sheet I linked to, but I've never had that problem. Um, then once it is dissolved, it is ready to use, um, but first I'm going to dilute it to a lower concentration before I use it in my PCR reaction. Also, if you're having problems getting dissolved, you can try um, incubating it at like 55 degrees Celsius um, for a few minutes. 
Um, with RNA, if you're worried about its like secondary structure that you need to like melt it, um, you can do like 90 degrees Celsius um, for a um, for like a couple minutes and then stick it on to ice um, to cool down. Okay, so that's going to be your stock concentration, but that's going to be w probably way higher than you actually want to use it at. So when you go to use it, well now, or when you're storing it to go to use it, you're going to have to do some calculations to dilute this. Um, and so this here, so again, there's like formal ways to do it and there's informal ways to do it. And so the formal way is you, like your C1B1 equals C2B2. Um, and the informal way is kind of just like doing it in your head with, with using that. Um, so C1B1 equals C2B2, or M1B1 equals M2B2, this initial concentration times initial volume equals final concentration times final volume. Um, then you can rearrange, plug in what you know, um, rearrange them to isolate the unknown, plug in what you know, and then map it out to solve the unknown. And I did a post on this the other day. Um, but so basically, you need to think kind of strategically when you're diluting your legos. You want to avoid pipetting a really tiny volume. So avoid pipetting anything less than like a microliter. Ideally do something like two microliters, five microliters, um, depending on your initial volume and how much that final volume would be. Um, and again, if you want to, you want to avoid doing like huge initial dilutions. So you can do dilution stepwise. So maybe if you want, you have a 100 micromolar stock and you want a final stock of 50 nanomolars, then you might want to dilute it at one to 100 to get to one micromolar, or and then one dilute that one to 20 to get to 50 nanomolars. Um, and just to note, when you see like one to 100 or whatever, that's typically meaning that you add one microliter. You, add 99 microliters of your water, your buffer, or whatever, to one microliter of your sample to get 100 full dilution, um, rather than like adding one plus 100. Um, but sometimes people can use it other ways, and so it can get confusing. Um, and so that's why I kind of wrote it out here. Um, so, so often, as because to, so that you can avoid in those doing those in those really small dilutions, I often start by choosing my initial volume. So choosing that V1. So maybe I'll say like choose my initial volume to be two microliters. If I choose that V1 to be two microliters, now I know that my initial concentration in this example is 100 micromolar, and I know that my um, the final concentration I want is one micromolar. So I can plug in these values, rearrange with, um, so that I isolate V2, and I can see that it's 200 microliters, and that's going to be my total volume. So now I need to subtract my initial volume from that total volume. So 200 minus 2 is 198. So I would take 2 microliters of my stock and dilute it in 198 microliters of my, um, of my buffer or my water. Um, and typically mixed by some gentle pipetting um, and spin it down and that sort of thing. Um, and so that's like the formal way and so work in it for anything. Um, the simplest way is, for simple dilutions is just to like realize, oh, that's just a hundred fold dilution. Um, so I need to divide the final volume by a hundred in my head if I know the final volume or I can just multiply my initial volume times 100. Um, so if I wanted 100 microliters, I would do like one microliter plus 99 microliters in my buffer of water, 200 microliters. Um, that would be two microliters plus 198 microliters in my buffer of water. So those are just like, those would be like simple ways to do it. And then if I wanted a final of 50 nanomolars, say, I could then, I could start from that one to 100 and then do a one to 20. So I'm avoiding having to do a like one to 2000 dilution, um, which wouldn't be very accurate. It would give me a huge volume that wouldn't even fit my tube. So hope that helps.